Good evening. Welcome to the Erev Shabbos Parsha class. This is the pre-Shabbos sermon for Parshas Bishalach. There is a joke. A rabbi, a chazan, and the gabai of the shul were traveling through the forest and they got caught by bandits. And the bandits hold them up and say, give, me, uh, give us your money and then uh, it's the end for you. And so the rabbi says, you know what, can I have a final wish? What's your final wish? I prepared a sermon for the high holidays. They're just around the corner. Such a great sermon. Just please let me review my sermon. The Chazan says, I also have a final wish. Oh yeah, what's your final wish? My final wish is I just rehearsed Ni'ila. Please let me just sing my Ni'ila before it's all over. The Gabbai says, I also have a final wish. And the bandit says, yeah, what's your final wish? They said, he says, kill me first. So, because <laughs> he doesn't want to hear the chazan, and he doesn't want to hear the sermon. <laughs> Enough already. Sorry, it's a joke. My daughter doesn't understand the joke. Uh, it's not a joke. It's not funny. Like this. We just read last week, we were discussing last week, that um, Rabbi Elezer ben Azariah, a young man, took the position of the leader of the academy in Yavne. Do you remember this from last week? So, right away he started enacting new rules what did he do on that first day in his leadership position he opened the doors of the yeshiva he opened them up so anybody who wants to can join yeah and on that day they added hundreds of benches it's a debate how many 300 or like 900 benches or 700 benches of students to the yeshiva and it also brought a new dynamic to the yeshiva on that on that first day they brought like 20 important questions to the academy, to the scholars, to be dealt with on that very day, the first day of Rabbi Elizabeth ben Azariah's leadership. One of those questions was the following issue. It says that in, our week, in, our, in this week's parsha, it says, Moshe and the Jewish people sang the song that we know as Oz Yashir, otherwise known as Shiras Hayam, the song at the sea. And the question was, what does it mean Moshe and the Jewish people sing? How does that work? They're both, like, there's a lot of lyrics. Who, who composed the lyrics? How did the Jewish people know this? Did they rehearse it beforehand? It's a technical question, but also a very meaningful and practical question. A very meaningful and, and, uh, and obvious question. And they wanted it answered. They brought it up on that first day of Rabbi Adezer ben Azariah's leadership. So... Um, there emerged three answers, three opinions. Rabbi Akiva is of the opinion that Moshe Rabbeinu composed and sang the song as a solo, and there was a response. I don't know what the official term for this is, but and if you know the official term, please punch it into the chat box. I will see it. But there, it was like a responsive song. Um, Moshe Rabbeinu sang... Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu saying like the words Yeshua, and the Jewish people said Ashira la Hashem. and he said um, and he said Zekeli and the people said Ashira la Hashem. and after every phrase after every phrase the people called out Ashira la Hashem. it's a certain kind of it's a certain kind of, of give and take between the leader the soloist and the people that's Rabbi Akiva's opinion, that that's what they did. Moshe Rabbeinu sang the whole song by himself and the people applauded him and agreed with him. They, they, uh, they encouraged his singing by responding to him, Ashir al Then there's another opinion, and this is now the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer. Rabbi Eliezer is of the opinion that uh, it was more like a full leader and response Moshe Rabbeinu sang a phrase, and the people repeated the whole phrase. And then there is the third opinion, and that is the opinion of Rabbi Nehemiah, that he said this was a, a miraculous collective effort, like now in Israel, there's this group called, Ku, called I don't know how you pronounce it actually, but I think it's called Kululam, where, they, where it's as if a whole stadium is performing a song together. It's quite beautiful. It's quite amazing. And uh, they've done some very um, traditional songs and some very modern songs and other things. 
but it's quite a beautiful setup. That's what happened at the sea. Everybody sang together word for word. Everybody, just these words out of gratitude and excitement and, uh, and uh, love for Hashem, these words just poured out. All the same words, all the same people, all at the same time. And the question, of course, is what are the theories behind these various opinions? Each one is coming from, everybody's basing their opinion on something. What are the theories behind all of these explanations? And the Rebbe goes through it uh, in a beautiful sicha, which I will try to summarize for you tonight. The Rebbe says, it's based on the following idea. What do we consider is the best Jew? What is considered the best Jew? So if you ask, in a gathering of people, you'll find that there are several answers. Some people will say an obedient Jew is a good Jew. Some people will say a deep Jew. Yeah. A person who identifies with his Judaism. That's a good Jew. And some say, some will say a Jew who has leadership skills, a Jew who leads the community. That's a good Jew. What does each of these things mean? You have sometimes a Jew who you command them something. They don't ask too many questions. They don't argue. They don't want to know too much information. They do as they are told and they do it well. They come to Shul on time. Yeah. Early in the morning, they daven. They participate in every shear that's being given in the Shul. And then and they don't bother anybody and they don't uh, make any trouble. And then they are off to their own affairs for the rest of the day. At night, they're back again. They do what they have to do. They're, they're called obedient. In Hebrew, it's called kabolas oil. And it's a very high level for sure. I mean, we, especially in Chabad, we love a kabolas oilnik. We call them, we call them the Baal Jews. They do exactly what they have to do and they do it seriously. That's one opinion. Another group will say that what a good Jew is, a person that's deep, that really tries to identify, that really tries to feel it, yeah? Not only to listen to the shir, but also to really understand, ask deep questions, come up with his own ideas sometimes to add to the conversation. You know, study to such, such a degree that he's able to repeat what he learned also to share it with other people. And then there's the third level of Jew, and that is a, a Jew that's a leader in the community. In other words, he's not just repeating what he's told. He's not just repeating what he learned previously. He's coming up with, he, you know, he, he's shining a light all of his own. He takes responsibility for what's going on in the community. He's interested, he's involved, he's volunteering. He's spending time, he's giving his resources to make sure that the community is growing and that every Jew is learning and that every Jew is fed and comfortable and the Jewish children are getting their Jewish education. This, uh, this is the difference between the three opinions about how the Jewish people sang that song, Oz Yasher, the Shira Sayam. Rabbi Akiva is of the opinion that the song at the sea emphasized the humility the obedience, the kabol asoil of the Jewish nation to Moshe Rabbeinu, which is a tremendous thing. The generation that left Egypt were powerful, powerful souls and great minds. They're called Dur Deya. A generation that really knew Hashem. They were really deeply connected to Hashem. Notwithstanding their tremendous spiritual level, all they did was shh, quiet, let Moshe Rabbeinu sing. And whenever he sings, we say, Amen. Or in that case, there was a song. So they said, Ashir al Hashem, sing to God. Or I will sing to God. That's Rabbi Kiva's opinion. That is a very high level and a great compliment to the Jewish people of that generation. Debbie Lezer has a different opinion. It's his opinion that the Jewish people, they took it a step further. Not only did they, they weren't satisfied just concurring, agreeing with Maishu Rabbeinu's music, but actually they wanted to repeat what Maishu Rabbeinu was saying. Maishu Rabbeinu felt it and Maishu Rabbeinu said it. 
they wanted to feel it and they wanted to say it too. That's a different level. And then Rabbi Nechemia comes and he says, what does Hashem really want? Hashem was demanding from the Jewish people a bit more. He doesn't just want students that can be dragged to their learning and just, you know, go through the motions and follow orders. He also doesn't even want students that willingly do that. Yeah, they're not being dragged. They're not being forced. It's not like they're obeying and obedient out of a lack of initiative. I, I, I'm interested. I'm, I'm putting in the work. Even that, Hashem, so, Rabbi, Hanani, Rabbi Hanani says, even that is not enough. What Hashem wants is leaders. Hashem wants people that take responsibility for the group, that take responsibility for the project, that take responsibility for the mission of making the world a dwelling place for Hashem, that they're doing it by their own strength. They're putting in their own resources and they're making sure that it's getting done. So, interesting debate. Who do you agree with? It's a discussion for a different time. We have to mull it over for a while. We can't decide right now. But one thing is important to point out. This week, the world marked 70 years from the Rebbe's leadership. And at the opening Fabrengen that the Rebbe held, held on the occasion of his acceptance of the leadership, the Rebbe made a drastic change the Rebbe declared there would be a drastic change in his leadership from the leadership of other, of, of basically of his colleagues, perhaps not of his predecessors, but certainly of his colleagues. What was it? The Rebbe said in these words clearly and openly, you may not, you must not rely on me to do it for you. I will help you. I will support you. You have to do the work by yourself. You have to carry the burden of responsibility for the community, for the Jewish nation, for Hashem's purpose and creation. You have to shoulder that burden. To make yourself a mensch, you have to do the work. To connect your heart and mind to Hashem, you have to put in the time. Don't rely on me to do it for you. Again, I help you and I will support you, but the work has to be done by you. And with that change, with that declaration, the Rebbe succeeded in taking average, very average normal people and turning them into a group of extraordinary people. People who literally carry the burden of the Jewish nation on their minds, on their hearts, on their shoulders. This is, by the way, the difference between Noyach from the flood and Avraham and their approach to leadership. Let's take a look at the, uh, at uh, we, us who are called Bnei Avraham. We're not called Bnei Noyach. Why are we not called Bnei Noyach? Noyach was a very important person in his generation. There was nobody like him. Um, and yet, we're not tracking our lineage back to him. Why? Because the Torah says Noyach was a man who followed Hashem. It says, Asher his halachti lefonov. Es ha'elikim es halich Noyach. Noyach walked with Hashem. But by Avram it says, I walked before Hashem. What's the difference between walking with Hashem and walking before Hashem? Rashi explains, Noyach needed constant support from Hashem to do the work that he was doing. Avroham took the initiative and was strong enough to do it on his own. He didn't wait for instructions. He didn't wait to be told what the mission was. He saw a need to spread godliness in the world and he did it. And this approach of Rabbi Nehemiah turns out to be um, uh, the, the message, the life that all of us have actually led in this year of, of the craziness of the corona. We say, what, uh, what kind of craziness is this that's happening to us in the world? What is this a punishment for? Why has Hashem done this to us? However, the, the silver lining of the whole story is that this has turned us 
into a nation of leaders. This has turned us into a nation of people taking responsibility for our lives, people taking responsibility for their communities. Everybody becomes a general in charge of an army. Everybody becomes, there's no more rov. Yeah, because there's no more shul. Thank God in America, the shuls are open. And that's just all the shuls are closed, up, they're closed again and again, over and over. The result of all of this is that everybody becomes responsible for your own Yiddishkeit. You're not relying on the Rav who's going to make a sermon. You have to learn the Torah yourself. The rabbi is going to review the parsha. No, you have to learn the parsha yourself. It has turned the Jewish nation by necessity into a nation of leaders. Everybody's a leader. Everybody's taking responsibility. So now we're able to understand something very, very important. The peak of a person's life defines the person. So what's the peak of Moshe Rabbeinu's life? The peak of Moshe Rabbeinu's life would be when he comes down the mountain having secured the Ten Commandments. But wait, which set? The peak of Moshe Rabbeinu's life would have been when he secured the second set of luchas. Why? And how do we know? Because when he came down with the second luchas, his face radiated such a, a light, such holiness, that people were afraid to even look at him. They couldn't look at him. They couldn't look at his face. Why? He had to wear a veil from then on. The only time he would remove his veil is if he was repeating to the people a message from Hashem. Otherwise, his face was veiled. The people would not look at him. Why? He, he spent 40 days and 40 nights in heaven with the angels. He didn't eat bread and he didn't drink water. He lived like an angel for 40 days and 40 nights when he brought down the first set of Luchais, the Ten Commandments. That didn't turn him into a radiant, angelic human being whose face you couldn't look at. No, it didn't. Why? What happened in the, in the case of the second Luchais that, that changed the nature of this person, Moshe Rabbeinu? The answer is the first Luchais Moshe Rabbeinu got in response to a gift from heaven. Hashem had decided He's going to give the Torah to the Jewish people and Moshe Rabbeinu is going to be the one to deliver them. So he climbs the mountain, he does the whole thing. It's Hashem's project. The project is over. Moshe Rabbeinu comes down the mountain and the people have sinned. Now Moshe Rabbeinu has a choice to make, a decision. And Moshe Rabbeinu chooses the people over the Torah. Moshe Rabbeinu chooses the people over the Creator. I'm not on your team anymore, he says to Hashem. You don't forgive the people, forget me. You and me are finished. Moshe says to Hashem, Moses says to God, in case Moshe says to Hashem is not clear enough, Moses says to God, you and me are done if you're not forgiving the people. The, that means, and the result of that decision on the part of Moshe Rabbeinu was the second set of tablets. You see the difference? The first tablets were the result of Hashem's decision. The second tablets were the result of Moshe Rabbeinu's decision. He himself took the initiative at the key moment in his life. Right, that should have been the peak of his life when he brought down the first luchas. That should have been the highest, the best. He couldn't get better than that. No, the people messed it up. He immediately understood his role. He immediately took the position of leader. He made that decision in a moment, smashed the luchas, and set out to secure forgiveness and to reconnect the Jewish people with Hashem.
Of course, Moshe Rabbeinu was changed by that decision. A human being, when he is put into a position of leadership, when he's put into a position of influencer, he's changed. So long as a person remains on the receiving end, it doesn't become, like they say in Hebrew, a new mitzios. It doesn't become a new a new existence, an entirely new creature. Put a person in a position of influencer. And you can change the person. Maishan Rabbeinu was transformed. Maishan Rabbeinu was changed. The... Um, it was a famous, famous Rav. Rabbi Yossi Jacobson tells the story. There was a famous, famous Rav who came to the Rebbe's Fabrengen one time. And uh, they had been, he and the Rebbe had met in Berlin. They had attended university at the same time in Berlin. And they'd become friendly. And then they moved to the United States and each person received the position that they received. This one was the head of a great institution and the great, uh, head of a great community of Jews and the Rebbe became the Rebbe in Lubavitch. And uh, they didn't have an opportunity to meet up with each other afterwards. He came to the Rebbe's birthday for bring at one time. I believe it was the birthday for bring. And um, afterwards, the Hasidim who escorted him out of the for and asked him for his uh, for his, to, to reflect on the experience, what he thought of the Rebbe and all that stuff. So the story goes that he said like this, when I knew him back then, he was a godel, that means a Torah giant. Now I look at him, now he's a Rebbe. I said, what do you mean? He said, Moshe Rabbeinu, when he brought down the Luchas the first time, he would have made a beautiful Rosh Hashiva. He would have been a great teacher. He would have been a great educator. He would have been a Torah giant. But that's not a Rebbe. When he lay his life on the line for his people, and he said to God, you and I are finished, if the Jewish people are not in the picture, that transformed him into a Rebbe. That's the difference that I see between the young M. Schneerson that I knew in Berlin and the Rebbe that I see here now in Kronheitz. This is a person who lives, who lives for his people. And Khan tells a story in one of the books that he published on the teachings of Hasidus. That, that uh, illustrates this point. He says, there was a once a chassid that came to the great tzaddik, Reb Chanuch Henuch of Alexander. And the Rebbe, the Alexander Rebbe asked him, why did you come here? What are you looking for? So the chassid said, I came here to draw on the holiness of the Rebbe and to be uplifted by the holiness of the Rebbe. And the Rebbe shook his head and said, no, that's not a good reason to come here. Really? Then... Would the Rebbe tell me, what is a good reason to come and visit the Rebbe? The Rebbe said, exactly the opposite is the best reason to come here. You have to find the holiness, come here to find the holiness that is in yourself and to be able to reveal it. That's why you come here. And he told him the following story. Once upon a time, there was a Jew named Rebbe Isaac from a city of Krakow in Poland. One night he had a dream that under the big bridge in, this, in the city called Prague, a uh, tremendous treasure is buried. That, that Jew woke up in the morning. He decided he's going to go to the bridge in Prague and he's going to dig up this treasure. While he was digging under the bridge, uh, a soldier approached him. An officer, a security officer approached him and said, excuse me, sir, tell me what you're doing here. You're under arrest. He had no choice. You know, he, he was worried about giving up his treasure, but he had no choice. He told the soldier all about the story. The dream he had, he dreamt that there was a, bri a bridge in Prague and he remembered the picture of the bridge and he remembered exactly where the treasure was, the whole, the whole story. The soldier hears him, 
hears him out and he starts laughing. Just crazy Jew. Who listens to dreams? I also had a dream. I had a dream that there's a Jew called Isaac in the nearest village of Krakow. And he has some kind of great treasure under his fireplace. Yeah. Do you see me traveling to Krakow looking for a Jew named Isaac and digging under his fireplace? It's just a dream. The Jew was so shocked to hear that there's a, that, that the real treasure is under his own fireplace. He doesn't say a word. Goes home and he digs up his fireplace. And lo and behold, there really is a tremendous treasure there. And he turns into a very, very wealthy man. Um, my nephew, his name is Rabbi Lazer Gorari is the shliach of the Rebbe in Krakow, Poland. And the shul where he is, is a shul called the Rebbe Isaac's shul. The way the story goes is that that shul was built by this guy from the money that he found in the treasure. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Says the Rebbe of Alexander to this chassid, that's why you're supposed to come here. You're supposed to come here so you can figure out how to dig up the treasure that's in you how you can become a leader, how you can shine brightly with a light all your own. Not that you should draw light from me and then go home and shine it all over your city. I will help you, but you have to shine your own light. Shabbos, thank you for joining.